So today we're talking about, uh, we're kind of picking up on where we were last week. We were talking about uh, meditation and uh, mindfulness, and I'm going to try and put those things together and talk about meditation and mindfulness and how that has to, what that has to do with stress management. Um, on my website, I don't know if you've been to my website, but I have a, a chart that I made up like 20 years ago on why people have anxiety in the first place, okay, and why they have more than their share of anxiety. Uh, somebody had asked me, well, probably 25 years ago, why me? Why, why, do, why am I so anxious? Why do I have so much stress? And so that got me thinking, and I, I wrote an article which is on my website um, entitled, Why Me? The Development of Your Anxiety Disorder. And you may not be able to see the fine print from where you're sitting, but... Uh, uh, it, uh, we start off with individual characteristics. You know, some people are just more genetically predisposed to anxiety. Some people just uh, feel more stress more acutely than other folks. Some people are bothered by flickering lights or uh, loud noises more than other people are. So we've got some genetic differences that kind of predispose you to maybe being an anxious person. But then there's a lot of stuff that can happen in childhood. Uh, that uh, kind of sets you up for an anxiety disorder. And again, this is on my website, so you, you can find it very readily there uh, with the article, Why Me? Childhood circumstances, uh, I, I mentioned that these are historical and they're fixed. You can't change them. You know, it's too late to have a happy childhood. Uh, but you can learn from it, and you can actually uh, find some advantages in having had some problems in your childhood if you can have it in a different perspective. Childhood circumstances are things like, um, I said, be careful programming, you know, like parents that are forever saying, well, don't do that, you know, well, watch out for that, maybe you shouldn't go out right now, you know, things like that. Parents are very anxious about your well-being and your safety, and so they kind of set you up to be kind of like hypervigilant. Um, excessive criticism, uh, well, you can't do that, well, don't, don't, don't do that, that's too hard for you, stuff like that. That makes people anxious about their performance, uh, extremely high standards and expectations, rules, rules, and more rules, um, family mythology, like we don't have problems in our family, so it's not okay to talk about your problems, and that, that tends to wind up generating a lot of stress, a lot of self-doubt. Um, I have people who are terribly embarrassed to come to me and tell me that they're having uh, panic disorder because that's something that's just not done in their family. You don't just do. You don't have those, those kind of problems in our family. That sort of mythology. Um, <coughs> suppression of feelings. Like the more you suppress feelings like anger, the more you're going to have a lot of anxiety. Um, uh, let me see. Uh, suppression of assertiveness. The more you think it's not okay to tell people what you think and what you feel, the more likely you are to have a lot of stress and anxiety. And this, this tends to be uh, more a female thing than, than, than a male thing. Uh, at least it has been historically, where uh, a, lot of, a lot of women grow up being taught to be uh, good and nurturing and not rock the boat, not make waves, don't ask for too much for yourself, uh, take care of other people, don't put your needs first, um, don't get angry, because that could be hurtful. And, so, and, and that kind of programming can generate a lot of anxiety. And we have things like uh, alcoholism in the family or major dysfunction in the family, um, neglect, rejection, abandonment, lack of safety, um, frustrated need for love and acceptance, excessive dependency being fostered, uh, kids raising parents. I see a lot of kids in my psychological practice, and, and a lot of these kids are putting in a lot of energy to take care of their parents, and their parents are confiding in them like a therapist and sharing problems with them, and, and uh, it's very inappropriate and really puts a huge burden on the kid. Um, human doings, what did I mean by that? Well, some people define, a lot of people define their worth by what they're doing, and uh, if they're not doing something important or impressive or perfect, uh, they feel like they don't have much worth. So all of those things in childhood can create a tremendous amount of anxiety in people. And then we have some con ongoing factors that I work with every day in my practice. These are things like uh, self-criticism, guilt, and shame. Uh, like I ask people, uh, all the people I work with with anxiety, I ask them very early on, I say, okay, 
Think about your self-talk. Think about when you're hanging out with yourself and you're talking to yourself about yourself. Is that self-talk uh, harsh and naggy and critical? Or is it warm and encouraging and accepting? And guess what? All the anxious people, virtually all the anxious people, I, I can't think of any exceptions. It's, it's harsh and naggy and critical. And uh, so I tell them that that's uh, the main task in therapy is to learn how to turn down the volume over there and turn up the volume over here. Okay? Uh, and, and pay attention to what their self-talk is all about, to be mindful of what their self-talk is all about. Um, distorted thinking, um, uh, fear talk or scare talk, um, a negative self-talk, um, people-pleasing, being non-assertive, thinking that uh, you know, they must please everyone all the time in everything they do. Uh, we all have some nutty beliefs. I, I've got nutty beliefs. I'm sure you have some nutty beliefs, right? If you only had one nutty belief, and, and being human, you know, we all have a whole bunch of them because we, being human, we all deny and distort and falsify reality all the time. But if you had only one, and that one was, I must please everyone all the time and everything I do, or it's terrible and I can't stand it, you're going to be in big trouble. Because if everyone's happy with you this week, you're still going to be anxious because they might stop being happy with you. And if they are unhappy with you, well, now you're going to be depressed. So you're depressed or anxious all the time if you have this one nutty belief. And other people kind of figure this out and they kind of use that against you. They kind of manipulate you this way. And then you, and since you can't get angry with them because uh, that would be displeasing them, you've got to stuff your feelings. You, this damages your self-esteem. This uh, generates a lot of anxiety and depression. Um, you don't quite know how to deal with people, so you wind up avoiding people. Then you're bored and lonely. So it's like it just kind of goes on and on with just one nutty belief. So people have these beliefs that can really generate a lot of stress and anxiety. Anxiety. And in mindfulness, I keep talking about mindfulness, that's uh, being able just to you know, slow down and breathe and just kind of observe your own thinking. And to f believe that your thinking is, these are only thoughts. Just because you have a thought doesn't mean that you have to jump on that train and ride it out of town. It's only a thought. It's just a story your mind is telling you. And in the in the mindfulness meditation, uh, I was listening to a, a Buddhist uh, teacher last night talking, and he was saying that uh, he was talking about your monkey mind. You know, your mind. He called it a monkey mind. You know, your mind is just all over the place. Your mind has to be busy. Your mind cannot be still. And if you have an untamed mind that's just all over the place, it's going to get into trouble. <laughs> it's going to start telling yourself things and. Probably the things that you're most afraid of is going to start ruminating on those and giving you scary messages about those things. So in, in mindfulness meditation, you're learning how to slow things down and to give this monkey mind a job. And the job is to be aware and pay attention and to meditate. Okay? Um, and through meditation, a lot of good things will, will come along. And this is, there's a lot of scientific evidence that you, you really can... Make, bring about tremendous changes in your, in your life physiologically and emotionally and psychologically by, by, through meditation. Um, other contributing factors, things like extremely high self-expectation, perfectionism. That's another thing. In my anxiety groups, and I do a number of them, uh, there are some common denominators. One big one is, besides self-criticism, is perfectionism. And that doesn't mean that they are perfect. It just means that they think they should be. And then they're terribly hard on themselves when they're not. Um, either or thinking. You know what that is? That's like either I'm um, perfectly smart or I'm totally stupid. It's like one or the other. It's this dichotomous thinking. There's nothing in between. Okay? Either... Uh, I work a lot with eating disorders as well. Either I'm, I'm perfectly thin or I must be the, the uh, most, uh, most uh, uh, out of shape person on the planet. Nothing in between. Um, feeling stuffed and stacked. It's like uh, feeling, some feelings are unacceptable, like anger. So you keep on pushing them down, pushing them down. And that generates enormous anxiety. Um, 
uh, re reactive to perceived criticism. Perceived criticism. Some people see criticism in almost everything. You know, um, someone will say, "Well, gee, I, I noticed your shoes today. Oh, they must think my, they must think these shoes are really outdated, and maybe I should do something about my." You know, they start immediately personalizing it and getting really upset and anxious about what they perceive as criticism. Um, need to appear calm, can't relax, but need to appear calm. A lot of my clients um, look, uh, you know, they, they have this, um, you know, happy outward appearance, and they smile a lot, and they joke a lot, and they they have they're on the verge of a panic attack on the inside. But it is so important to them that they look like they have it all together, and that takes a lot of energy, and that also generates a lot of a lot of anxiety. Um, uh, learned avoidance behaviors. Uh, a lot of anxious folks, they wind up thinking that the best way they can deal with anxiety is just to avoid anything that has made them feel anxious. And before you know it, you're avoiding a lot of things. You're avoiding uh, anything where you might possibly fail. Well, your life winds up being kind of empty and, and uh, not much fun um, if you're, if you're going to be totally safe and not ever take any risk. The, the people who are really successful at anything are people who are risk risk takers. Uh, then we have uh, you know lack of uh, self nurturing, denial of needs and feelings. Some people just they're, they're absolutely codependent. They're into taking care of everybody else. Everybody else's needs and feelings are more important than theirs. Um, they shouldn't ever think about themselves first, or maybe even at all. Um, then there are relationship problems. There's uh, the stress of unmet needs. There's shallow breathing and muscle tension, which we've talked about a lot. It's like the more you're, you have this uptight uh, breathing, this upper chest uh, breathing, the more you're generating just by, by vir virtue of being in your sympathetic nervous system, the more you're generating this fight or flight response and a lot of anxious feelings. What? Don't do that to me. Okay. <laughs> Um, then uh, I'm having trouble reading my own slide here. A disregard of or overreaction to emotional and physical signs. Anxious people are kind of like natural hypochondriacs. It's like, oh, I never noticed this feeling in my arm. Oh my God, well, maybe it's bone cancer. Maybe you know they start doing a lot of what if thinking. What if this happens? What if that happens? Um, uh, disregard of or overreaction to uh, emotional and physical signs. I said that substance use, stimulants, a lot of people use substances to relax and that winds up actually creating more problems. Uh, and sometimes people have significant life changes or losses that generate a lot of anxiety. Some people um, go through a major change in their life and then start having panic attacks. And maybe they've always been somewhat anxious but this kind of put them over the top, and now they're, they're having panic attacks. Um, lack of meaning or purpose in life, having this kind of existential crisis where uh, life's just not going well and you really don't know what your life is supposed to be all about. So all of these things in adult life can generate a lot of stress and anxiety. Okay? And then with deepening the stress, we have, you can have stress overload, and you can have, uh, for some people, they just push harder, can't relax. And that's when they start having migraines and other physical kinds of things. Or they get into uh, drugs and alcohol or an eating disorder. Um, they, people particularly who can't do, accept their own needs and feelings, who ignore bodily signals, who uh, uh, aren't supposed to have a problem and can't ask for help, they're particularly vulnerable and they wind up with a full-fledged anxiety disorder. Now, people who are simply having a lot of stress in their life also have a lot of this stuff going on that they need to pay attention to. And in my steps, which you don't have a copy of my steps, right? Um, in, in my steps, I address all those things. And if, if you work the steps, and if you'll send me an email, I'll just, I'll be glad to, and my email address is WC Shearer, that's W-C-S-H-E-A-R-E-R -E -E at earthlink.net. I'll be glad to send you all the material that they got earlier. 
Yeah, and if you work my steps, I've got ten steps, and if you work those, you will, I almost guarantee it, uh, that, that you'll have tremendous uh, relief from anxiety and stress in your life. Okay? And I, I recommend that people look at the self-test for all the steps, like at least once a month, but then zero in on those things they really want to improve upon. Okay? And the rest of you can send me an email too at some point, and, and, and just so you're on my email list, because when I get the action planning guide done, which is a couple hundred pages, I'll be glad to send that to you as well. Okay? Okay, so that's kind of how an anxiety disorder develops. That's how highly stressed people kind of get to be highly stressed. All right, and you might, in, in the article that goes with this on my website, I ask people to rate each of these little boxes, like zero to four, like how, how true is this for you? Guess what? After you go through this and read the description on each of the little boxes and check the boxes and put a number on there, you have a ready-made treatment plan. Okay? You can look at that and you can see instantly what kind of things you need to stop avoiding and start addressing. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, I'm, uh, I'm driving over, I was thinking about this, I was thinking about I need to develop another chart, and that other chart should kind of flow like this. You know, you start off with awareness that, okay, I have a lot of stress in my life, number one. You've got to know, a lot of anxious people don't know that they're anxious. What do they compare it with? They've always been anxious, so it feels normal. Uh, the saying is, uh, a fish discovers water last. Does that make sense? Okay? Um, so once you're aware that you have a, too much stress and anxiety in your life, well, then you need an intention to do something about it. You decide, hey, I'd like to have a calm, peaceful life. So you have this intention, and you have a commitment that you're going to work on these things. Because there's nothing... In, in psychology that is uh, easier to work with than working with anxiety disorders if people just know what to work, how to work on it, okay? Um, then you need specific practice, and that's what my steps are all about. It's like fine-tuning it so you can really zero in on very specific things you need to address. And I tell people, you don't have to work on all the steps every day. Focus on the ones that you really, really want to change. Maybe just one of them. And work on that for 10 days or so and, and prove to yourself that you can master that and then go on to another one, okay? Yes. And then you get, you, with the, uh, my assessment device, you're getting feedback. Like every time you do it, you're getting feedback on how you're doing. We're going to try and make this into an app for like iPhone, you know, because I think it would work very well there, all right? Uh, you get specific feedback and then you can fine tune your practice. And then you can keep going and you develop new habits and then before you know it you're managing your stress and anxiety much much better and you're having much better quality of life so it's not just about managing stress it's about really having your life go a whole lot better okay so let me turn off that light uh, before I go blind and uh, Uh, so, mindfulness. Mindfulness is about being able just to slow things down and just see things more clearly, um, tame that monkey mind, you know, just be able to observe your thoughts and accept that they're only thoughts. They're just thoughts. They come and go. Um, in my group last night, we had several people who have... And these are very successful people. You know, these are very, very effective, successful people outwardly, but they have a lot of anxiety. And each of these folks had a whole lot of uh, negative self-talk. They weren't good enough. And they, w they would have this thought, they've had this thought since they were 10 years old, or before that even. The thought pops into their head, I'm not good enough. And they just go with it. I'm not good enough. Well, hey, I have the thought. It must be, it must be true. I, I thought it, so I must go with it. And what we're doing is teaching them, and we also, I'm also teaching them meditation, teaching them how to really slow it down and accept the fact that these thoughts are only thoughts. They're just learned beliefs. And the good news there is that if you 
if you learn to tell yourself stuff like this, you could learn to tell yourself something else, something that's far better supported by the evidence and far more realistic. Uh, and they're all making progress. That's the thing I really love about working with anxiety disorder, stress and anxiety disorders is that if people really want to put in the effort and, and, and work the program, they're going to have a lot less stress and anxiety in their life. Okay? Um, so mindfulness is about, it's, it's a discipline. It's, um, and it goes hand in, hand in hand with mindfulness meditation. You don't have to meditate to do mindfulness. You can do mindfulness anytime you slow yourself down, breathe from your diaphragm, which is getting into your, your, uh, your parasympathetic system, which is all about letting go. Just slow it down and just be aware of your thoughts without distraction. Anytime you're doing that, you're being mindful. And you're probably meditating as well in that moment. Okay. Um, pace of life today is so fast that very few of us slow down very much to, to really reflect like that. And that's also why people have so much more anxiety than they used to have. And they, that, that's literally true. By all measures, uh, we are becoming a very stressed out society. Uh, within a decade, uh, depression is going to be the most debilitating illness uh, that we experience, along with anxiety, because they usually go together. Um, we're probably moving in the wrong direction. So learning how to manage all this and be more mindful, and even practicing mindful meditation, which th those, those things really go together, it could be very helpful. Um, I want to shift the focus and talk about meditation just for a little bit and play a couple of things for you here. I've got a lot of things on my iPad. I love my iPad. I didn't think I would, but uh, my iPad has become such a tool that uh, I, I use it like constantly. Okay. Ten, ten ways to relax during your busy day. And this was by a guy named Mike Moore. Ten ways to relax during your busy day. You all have busy days, I'm sure, right? Okay. So let's, let's talk about these. His first thing, which would be my first thing too if I were making this list, is take three deep breaths slowly. It really works to relax the body and mind. And we talked about this before. We talked about diaphragmatic breathing. and You can do this a number of ways. One way is, you know, you, if you want to experience, you put your hands like on the lower part of your rib cage like that. You can do that right now. Okay? You can put your hands there and apply pressure and keep that pressure up. And now breathe in such a way that you're pushing against your hands. And if you're doing this right, and way back into your chest, you should feel this kind of like release, you know? And just Anxious people have trouble doing this, <laughs> okay? Anxious people, I have people in my office every day and they say, nothing's happening, I can't do it. And they literally cannot breathe diaphragmatically unless they practice it a lot. Okay, And with the practice, uh, I've said this, I'm repeating myself, I know, but with the practice, it does some amazing things. You become aware of your breathing like 24-7 and you start catching yourself being uptight. And that becomes a signal to remind yourself to, oh yeah, breathe. And now you know how to breathe. Okay, And you're literally retraining your breathing. So we always start, my first step is breath awareness and retraining of my 10 steps, okay? So I'm right, right here with uh, Mike Moore. Take three deep breaths. I call it a mini relaxation. At any time during the day, you could just, right in the middle of whatever you're doing, you could remind yourself to breathe diaphragmatically. Three deep breaths. Really deep and full and slow. And if you've been practicing, it's, it's, it's gentle and relaxed. It's not forced. It's not, it's not like that. It's just the most natural thing in the world if you've been practicing. And you take three deep breaths and you just quiet your self-talk and you just lower the volume a little bit and say, all right, slow it down, let it go. Now, you're being mindful at that point. And you're also probably meditating because it's very easy to cross over into this meditative kind of feeling. So Mike Morey says, take three deep breaths slowly. It really works. It does. Second, he says, 
Relax the tongue. Usually the tongue is held tightly against the teeth. Free it up in the mouth so it can just rest there without tension. Hmm. Yeah, try that. And I, I will also, also I just kind of like relax your eyes. You know, just kind of let your eyes kind of roll back a little bit and just soften your gaze. Uh, relax your facial muscles. You, if you think about it, you can actually relax your face and your, you can even smile. Think of something pleasant and smile. It changes your brain chemistry. Absolutely. And neuroscience is finding amazing things in the last decade or so you know, about how you can use your mind to actually change your brain. Okay? Really exciting stuff. Then he says, uh, take... Uh, Take one-minute vacations. One-minute vacations. In your mind, visit places where you find peace and stillness. Picture yourself there soaking up the beauty and solitude. Do you all have a favorite place? You know, or a setting? Mine is always like the mountains. For some people, it's the beach. For me, it's like a mountain lake. Uh, but you can just you can just uh, take a few moments and breathe diaphragmatically and you know just think about that peaceful place and it changes everything. It takes a minute, a minute to lower your stress level, and if you do that regularly, guess what? Stress is cumulative. It kind of builds throughout the day. It gets higher and higher, and up here somewhere you might have a panic attack. Okay, well at any time you you can regularly, very regularly, you can. Take a little stress break and bring it down. If things are getting to you in the office, get up and walk around the building or something. You know, just take a stress break. Um, we haven't talked about walking meditation, but that's kind of a favorite of mine. It's just to walk around slowly. Not an exercise walk, but walk around slowly and let yourself relax. Um, also, Mike says, he says, uh, relax your facial muscles. This is what we were talking about before. When we tense, we frown and squint, which adds to the tension. Tell your facial muscles to relax, and they will. Try to maintain this relaxed face throughout the day. Um, yeah, just think about relaxing your facial muscles, and it does change things. I notice you're working your shoulders over there. Yeah, there's all kinds of things you can do to kind of like free yourself up. You don't have to be you know, tight all day long. Let me see, what else does Mike say? He says, um, move slowly. When you find yourself rushing for no reason, slow down. Slow down. And don't let somebody else's pace become your tempo. You know, don't let them set the pace for you. You, you probably work around uh, really stressed out people who, who are in a frenzy sometimes and they're going like 90 miles an hour. You, you don't have to match their pace. That's very stressful. Set your own pace. Um, then he says, laugh more. Laughter. Um, he says, laugh more. Laughter cuts stress and promotes relaxation. Uh, anytime you're laughing, um, you're, you're probably.